The late Roman army, infamously, perhaps, had multiple problems it had to deal with in late antiquity, including what appears to be a manpower shortage. The Romans could not replace casualties after a certain point. Is this really the case, though? And if it is true, what caused it? After all, the army of the Roman Republic appears to have been able to absorb large-scale losses, but it appears to have been unable to do this in the 4th and 5th centuries. The short, sort of cop-out answer is that this doesn't officially have an answer for certain, so a 100% for sure explanation is likely not going to happen. But we can make an educated guess. To do this, we actually have to reframe the question. Roman military historian Patricia Southern writes the following in her book, The Roman Army, A History from 753 BC to AD 476. At the end of the 4th century, Theodosius had to reissue and reinforce the laws pertaining to recruitment that had been passed from Diocletian's time and during the reigns of Valentinian and Valens. Sons of veterans were forced to enlist, and anyone producing slaves instead of suitable recruits from their estates were to be punished. By 406, all scruples about slaves were dropped, and the government was calling them to arms. Manpower shortage for the army is not the same thing as population shortage. It has been argued that there was not really a serious manpower shortage at all, and that the increasingly savage legislation concerning recruitment was passed only at times of danger when troops had to be raised quickly. But the fact that the laws were passed at all must surely indicate that while there may have been plentiful population, which is subject to debate, there were problems in finding suitable and willing men, whether or not the need for them was caused by a mini-crisis of some sort. The problem may not have concerned available population, but the ability to turn the population into soldiers. You will find similar descriptions of the military situation of the late Roman army in other military or social histories of late antiquity, so the question to ask, then, is not what led to a manpower problem, since archaeological evidence strongly suggests that in the 4th century the population was often expanding, it's what led to a recruitment issue, which is not exactly the same thing, and the subsequent employment of barbarians and the logistical problems, which, of course, made everything that much harder. During the early Republic and the mid-Republic, the military was largely based on a militia model, and this worked because of the city's small size and political institutions. Military service was a key part of what the citizen body did, and it was essentially a requirement. But, as the Roman Empire expanded and acquired more territory and people, mobilizing the total population of the state was not fully possible. This is, in the history of warfare, what makes the French Revolution of 1789 so important, because during the French Revolutionary Wars, the nation itself was mobilized. Whether Rome had an ancient form of nationalism is debated, but in the general absence of such a phenomenon, or at least the appearance of an absence, mobilization proved far more difficult. The Roman army also altered its function as the state itself changed. The Roman army also altered its function as the Roman state itself changed. The development of an empire forced the military to change into a highly professionalized fighting force in which military service was done for 16 to 20 years, and it became a system through which citizenship could be acquired and through which members of the population could become upwardly mobile and eventually retire comfortably with some land of their own. The key difference between the military of the High Empire and the Late Empire is that during the High Empire, the Pax Romana, the nature of administration was decentralized and based on incorporating local elites into the system, so the military fulfilled both military and civilian functions. After the reforms of Diocletian and further reforms under other late Roman emperors, the civilian administration expanded significantly, and the military took on a role that was, well, essentially just military. So what did these reforms look like? The crisis of the 3rd century lasted from about 235, starting with the assassination of Severus Alexander, to the rise of Diocles, better known as Diocletian, in 284. Within this 50-year period, the Roman Empire split into three states. There were at least 30 emperors, Germanic peoples like the Goths and the Franks raided and invaded across the frontiers, the Persians attacked in the east, and as we are recently learning, the Roman Warm Period came to an end. The 3rd century in Eurasia was a period in which temperatures cooled, affecting agricultural cycles and sparking a food crisis. 
The plague of Kyprian, we are also learning, appears to have been significantly more widespread than we once thought. The end result of all of this, essentially, is that the Roman Empire nearly fell apart, but it was saved by a military revolution. The emperors of the late 200s and the 300s hailed from military frontier zones, especially in the Balkans, and under their direction, the empire and the military was reworked. Our evidence is extremely patchy, but we know that the Emperor Gallienus, in the 260s, began to increase the amount of cavalry in the army. We don't know what happened to his army after his death in 268, but his successors, Claudius II and Aurelian, in the early 270s, also employed larger numbers of cavalry. Aurelian specifically demanded 40,000 cavalry and 80,000 infantry from the Uthungi, and 2,000 infantry from the Vandals in exchange for peace. We don't know exactly what these troops were for. The Romans had never stopped recruiting, well, Romans, so it's entirely possible that these newly acquired troops, assuming Aurelian even had this many and the numbers are not inflated, were used to plug holes in the existing Roman units and to replenish the total number of troops. Under Diocletian, the provinces became reorganized onto what could arguably be termed a permanent war footing, where Fabricae, the factories which created weapons, armor, and clothing, came under state control, forts were reconstructed and more forts were built across the frontiers, watchtowers were established along roads, and the Tetrarchy was established which allowed each of the four emperors who now controlled one quarter of the state to draw on their own resources, but at least in this period, we do not have strong evidence of a reserve force. These reforms, which built on those of the 3rd century, were continued by Constantine, oftentimes so seamlessly that we don't really know where one reform ends and another begins. Diocletian also implemented conscription laws, something which had been present in Roman society before, but which now appears to have increased, probably because the plague of Cyprian and the chaos of the 3rd century severely damaged the population base from which soldiers could be drawn, and gaps needed to be filled, and which were partially based on land. These laws never go away, although they are modified. The end result of all of this, however, was the establishment of the field armies and the frontier armies of late antiquity. In late antiquity, contrary to popular memory, this reformed military was generally very effective. Battles such as Adrianople stand out to us because of the magnitude of the defeat suffered by the Romans. A sizable portion of the eastern army was destroyed in 378, and it does not appear to have fully recovered by the time the Huns began raiding the Roman Empire in the early 400s, but campaigns and battles in late antiquity often involved more men than Adrianople. The Battle of Strasbourg in 357, for example, has around 45,000 soldiers fighting in total, and the Battle of the Frigidus in 394 has something like 50,000 on each side. And generally, these battles saw the Romans win. Many campaigns and battles, though, involved comparatively smaller numbers. We have evidence of armies being fielded with around 20 to 25,000 soldiers, and around the year 400, while the numbers are not exact, what we have in terms of evidence, especially coming from the Notitia Dignitatum, suggests that the army was somewhere between 350,000 and 500,000 troops, although one estimate suggests maybe 600,000, with the smaller unit numbers perhaps indicating unit size so as to be more flexible, or maybe command limitations, so major defeats stand out to us in part because they appear to have been so unusual, such as the Huns' victory over the Romans at the Battle of the Utus. We don't know how many Roman casualties there were, but we have enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that the three field armies they sent out were devastated. Eventually, the losses sustained could not be replaced, and the army, so the argument goes, turned to barbarians. In general, the idea that this is what led to the destruction of the army is what's known as the barbarization thesis, and it's not really taken seriously anymore. So, with that said, let's talk about this a bit. Utilizing non-Roman troops was a long-standing practice for the Roman state, and despite soldiers not being allowed to legally marry until the end of the second century, this did not prevent them doing so or from having families. For those stationed along the forts on the frontiers, it would not have been unusual for soldiers to have relations with those living across those same frontiers. The two parties traded often enough, Romans scouted the area, 
the barbarians regularly were in contact with the Romans as well, and were often allies, so it would not be all that strange for a boy of mixed parentage to follow in his father's footsteps. Additionally, in late antiquity, we know that estates and other large units of land employed people from across the frontier, so it also would not have been unusual for Romans to have heard Germanic languages and to know barbarians, for example. My overall point is that the Romans and the barbarians have a long, mixed, complicated relationship. So in late antiquity, as we have already gone over, the military was still large, in the hundreds of thousands. So where were these troops coming from? Doing anything with ancient population statistics is difficult, but with the various ranges for army size and total population, in the literature you will see the annual recruitment numbers required to maintain a functioning army fluctuate between about 20,000 and about 45,000 people a year. The problems of the 3rd century, combined with the Edict of Caracalla, which drastically expanded the Roman citizenship when it was instituted in 212, not only reduced the attractiveness of military service, but also reduced the population pool from which people could be found to enlist. The results were various laws passed in the 4th century which forced sons of soldiers to follow in their father's footsteps, and forced others to join as well, but the population appears to have rebounded in the 4th century. So if there wasn't a manpower shortage, as we've already gone over, then what gives? Why was there a recruitment problem towards the end of the 300s and into the early 400s all of a sudden? The answer may very well lie in the reforms that made the Roman state so powerful and so able to weather the storms of the 4th century. The old way the Roman state worked during the Pax Romana was as a decentralized one. The local elites were co-opted into the system and allowed to retain local power. Due to Diocletian's reforms, among the reforms of others, the bureaucracy expanded, going from a few hundred in the time of the Julio-Claudians and the Flavians to upwards of 35,000 in late antiquity. There was also the presence of what historian of religion Peter Brown calls the late antique counterculture, that is to say, the rise of monasticism and the Christian church. This system appealed to people and offered an alternative to government service or the military, and it's been estimated, how securely I have not been able to reliably determine, that the total number of people serving in the church or related bodies was something like half the size of the Roman army. But, while Christianity has been blamed in the past, we now recognize that this is an incorrect view and it should not be overstated. The recruitment issue was not caused by this, but it was a factor we need to take into account. The historian Kyle Harper sums up the continued strength of the army very well when he writes the following in his recent book, The Fate of Rome climate, disease, and the end of an empire. The population grew, but the margins of abundance had been thinned. Even after the crisis had passed, the old, easy ways of military recruitment could not be resumed. The late antique state was heavy-handed. Diocletian and Constantine required sons of soldiers and veterans to follow their fathers into the military life. Army service became virtually a heritable status. A combination of harsh violence and lucrative enticement was used to replenish the ranks. Standards were discreetly slackened. 5 foot 7 became the minimum height in theory. Notoriously, barbarian units were enrolled to fill the gaps. But it would be simplistic to ascribe the challenges of military recruitment to a manpower shortage without qualification. The 4th century state had to contend with at least one truly novel alternative to military service the allure of the religious life for men who might have heeded the call to arms. The huge army of clergy and monks were for the most part idle mouths. By the end of the 4th century, their total number was perhaps half the size of the actual army, a not inconsiderable drain on the manpower reserves of the empire. The civil service was also an attractive and safe career. The vexing issue of military recruitment in the 4th century was not directly a demographic problem. The raw military power wielded by the 4th century Roman state was still extraordinary. Its scale of coordination was astonishing. The Roman army fielded half a million men, including 70,000 specialized troops, recruited and trained to ancient standards of discipline. The army was supplied and equipped by the most extensive logistical system the world had ever seen. The provision of weapons, armor, uniforms, animals, and food depended on the imperial machine that Diocletian and Constantine had built. The Roman soldier carried arms manufactured in over three dozen specialized imperial factories spaced across three continents. Officers wore bronze armor, 
embellished with silver and gold, made it five different plants. Roman archers would have used bows made in Pavia and arrows made in Macaw. The foot soldier was dressed in a uniform, shirt, tunic, and cloak, made at imperial textile mills and finished at separate dye works. He wore boots made at a specialized manufactory. When a Roman cavalryman of the late 4th century rode into battle, he was mounted on a mare or gelding that had been bred on imperial stud farms in Cappadocia, Thrace, or Spain. The troops were fed by a lumbering convoy system that carried provisions across continents in mind-boggling bulk. The Emperor Constantius II ordered 3 million bushels of wheat to be stored in the depots of the Gallic frontier, and another 3 million bushels of wheat in the Alps, before moving his field army to the west. When an army of northern barbarians undertook a campaign, its leaders did not think in terms of millions of bushels of wheat. An unbiased observer in the later 4th century would have noted the Roman army's numerical, tactical, and logistical superiority on all fronts. But within the space of a few generations, the Roman imperial army in the west would cease to exist. The former territories of the west would be carved into successor kingdoms. The failure of empire was one of the greatest strategic implosions in history. As we have come to appreciate the reality of the empire's recovery in the 4th century, it has actually become harder to explain this failure. So, what's happening here is that Roman society was undergoing several changes at roughly the same time, perhaps the most important of which is that the governing system changed. The creation of an imperial bureaucracy made the government and tax collection far more efficient, but it altered the nature of the Roman elites. Where they once were allowed to keep their old positions in a decentralized state, the new centralization and the remodeling of what it meant to be an aristocrat meant that gendered notions of manliness and honor became attached to the civil service, not the military. In 383, things went wrong for the Emperor Gratian, to borrow a quote from Guy Housel's book, barbarian migrations in the Roman West. What essentially happened was that there was a rebellion in Britain by one of the generals, Maximus. The long story short is that these political problems don't stop, and by 396, the Roman Empire was ruled by the two sons of the Emperor Theodosius, the last emperor to control the entire state as one unit. The problem was that the sons, Honorius in the West and Arcadius in the East, were all of 10 and 16 respectively, and the imperial system was designed to function with adults, not children. Through the mishandling of political and military problems, warlords and generals rose to prominence, and by about 430, the West had a supreme general, Flavius Aetius. He had risen to power by prioritizing politics, not the barbarian threat. But how could this be? Surely the barbarians were a problem. Well, not necessarily, at least to the Romans. Once again, major defeats and setbacks stand out to us because they stood out to the Romans themselves, which is where we, once again, come back to the Battle of Adrianople in 378. In 378, the Goths win this battle, and a significant portion of the eastern army was hamstrung, with many of their officers killed. I've come across estimates which say something like 30 to 40 percent, but I don't know if that's actually verified. The Romans win other battles and skirmishes in the Gothic War, but this is the big one, and records from the Eastern Empire suggest that refilling the army's numbers were a problem for about a generation. The Goths were brought to the table, and they sent troops to serve in the legions in exchange for land and food. What happens is, essentially, the Goths turn into a Roman army. Identity becomes mixed and gendered. To be a Gothic man was to be ethnically a Goth, but also to be a Roman soldier, it's what they did. To be a Goth was to be a soldier. In 410, the Goths, led by a man named Alaric, who claimed to be their king, and I say claimed because this appears to be a new title, infamously sacked Rome and ravaged Italy. Eventually, they were brought to heel once more, and they were settled in southwestern Gaul as federati, essentially allied soldiers. Now, those ideas of gender and ethnicity concerning military identity also bled over into the forces recruited from native Romans. It's estimated that maybe something like a quarter of all Roman forces in late antiquity were recruited from barbarians, again, something which is not unusual as we have already covered, and we have DNA evidence which strongly suggests that some of these people were taken from as far away as southern Norway, but this takes on a larger-than-life picture because of the sheer amount of barbarian stuff in the military art styles, weapons, banners, unit names, war cries, etc. 
were adopted by the Romans, or rather they adopted what they thought were barbarian things, because barbarians were believed to be good fighters and good warriors. To paraphrase Guy Housel, barbarian stuff was adopted because it looked cool and it was thought to be terrifying. Barbarians were the ones you wanted to recruit because cultural stereotypes made them seem ferocious. War was what barbarians did, and for most of the 4th century, the Romans could deal with the majority of whatever threat those barbarians could muster, until Adrianople. Now, the political problems which the Romans faced in the 420s and 430s included some rebellions which could be dealt with, but it also included heavy raids and in at least one case an actual mass invasion. The Vandals and some others who crossed the Rhine in 406 and who burned their way into Spain. The Huns also began to attack in force. What this does is it breaks several provinces away from the Western Empire by about 440, which you can see on the map in green, and it forces the government to slash taxes in other provinces. While the Romans statistically won most of the battles, there were serious defeats or at least draws in 406, 409, 411, 419, 422, 425, 427, 429, and 433. If you recall from earlier, I mentioned that it is estimated that the Romans needed something like 20 to 45,000 people a year to maintain the armies. So what happens here is that these defeats are grievous enough that the Romans can't replace them because they're starting to lack the provinces to actually do the recruiting, and they're lacking the tax revenue to even pay for these troops. And while the Roman army still existed, and it was still effective, if it was going to reassert itself, it was going to need help, and it was going to need time. The shift from the militia of the early and mid-republic to the professional military of the high and late empire meant that the Romans needed time to train their soldiers, and after a certain point, the resources and the time were not there. It's not so much that the Romans did not want to fight for their country, so much as they lost the recruiting grounds and the resources which enabled them to do that. As an analogy, this would be like America trying to replace heavy casualties sustained over a 30-year period, except that the Northeast and the Western states have been lost, the South is burned, and the Midwest is the only place paying taxes in any significant number. The state can bounce back, but it's going to take time. Hence, the Roman Empire, beginning in the 420s, began to rely increasingly on barbarian allies, bringing them into the empire and settling them, and hoping to gain time to rebuild their strength. What was happening wasn't barbarization far from it, it was just a stepping up of previous policies. Indeed, it's estimated that at this point, by the mid-400s, the actual number of non-Romans in the military is something between 30 and 35% so slightly more than it would have been in the 300s. Any attempt, therefore, to paint the Roman army's problems in late antiquity as a failure of the Roman military or anything else misses the point. This was less of a singular issue, and more like death by 1,000 cuts. There were simply too many problems and too short of a time to adequately respond. And this is the horrifying thing about the late Roman Empire, especially the Western Empire. By most, if not all measures, the 300s were comparatively fine. The empire was doing very well. But the 5th century saw a rapid series of problems which built upon each other and were mishandled. These would continue until the same structures which made it so effective in the 300s could not be maintained by the central government, so the bureaucrats and the local militaries and local people looked for a new power structure to attach themselves to, and thus have some semblance, of the stability they had once known, which came in the form of the barbarians. The Roman Empire then did not die a natural death, nor was it murdered or militarily defeated. It accidentally committed suicide.